Hey everybody, it's Anna and welcome back to my booktube channel. This video this video is going to be my geekly wrap up for the week of April 20th through April 26th, the week where I realized that May is just around the corner and I am 100% not ready for it. This week I managed to read five books with varying degrees of enjoyment. I played one board game, I finished the Final Fantasy VII Remake, and we co-hosted another successful edition of the Disability Readathon. So let's go ahead and talk books first. Pause for a moment because I ended up picking a book club book for my romance book club that I thought turned out to be a major dud. And that was How to Love Your Elf by Carrie Lynn Sparks. I thought that the title was going to mean that this book was going to be a fun fantasy romance and it was just a bad fantasy romance. We're just following this lady called Sorcha, who is extremely generic. Uh, I thought that for a second it was going to be interesting because she talks about kind of being the one of her sisters that always gets looked over because she's less flashy and she doesn't have these special talents. Um, but no, it's really just because she actually is boring and doesn't really have anything interesting about herself. She falls in love with this guy that we only know as the woodsman for the entire book almost, even though it's painfully obvious that he's actually like secretly a prince of these elves. And Sorcha is just literally the best at everything, despite thinking that she's nothing special. Everybody seems to like her. She magically like speaks in everybody else's languages. It's done through the most annoying thing though, which is when authors try to write in dialect, but they're really inconsistent about it. So what I hated about this dialect in particular was the fact that sometimes Sorcha would just change the word you to the word ye, so it's like, ye don't know what you're doing. But it wasn't consistent when she was doing it, and it was really annoying because it was the only kind of thing that was different about the way that she talked, and it just seemed like it was trying to make her seem cooler than she actually was, which was just not very cool. Another thing that really annoyed me about this book is that the woodsman, who is the love interest, has this like magical through line to being able to talk to the ancient trees. That's all capitalized. And the trees are just kind of like the tutorial in a video game that tells you that you're going the wrong way because these trees literally pop out of the woodwork yes, that was intentional, to just be like, hey, this is what you need to do. This is where you need to be going. So they switch from trying to sound like these cool, ancient, wise trees to literally being Navi from Legend of Zelda yelling at you because you're going the wrong way or you're about to run out of health or something like this. This book was really annoying. I couldn't stand it. I gave it two out of five stars. It's going to be an interesting book club meeting when we go talk about this because I voted for it. I hated it. I just don't really care. All right, and then I finished reading Queer Disability Anthology, which is edited by Raymond Lukjak, which was my third book for my TBR for the Disability Readathon. This is an anthology of some personal essays, poetry, short works of fiction, and even a couple of comics that are all by authors that identify as queer and disabled. Something that I like about this book is that it was actually the first time that this small press, which was dedicated originally to um, specifically publishing like deaf authors and deaf poets, it was the first time they had done something specifically with an LGBT focus. But like most anthologies, I thought that the quality of the pieces within were kind of hit or miss. Some of them really resonated with me, and then some of them were ultimately like very forgettable or not really something that I was interested in reading at all, particularly the fiction in this. I'm not sure why. I found that by and large, I enjoyed most of the essays. I enjoyed most of the poetry. Even if it wasn't the best written, like it still had a compelling story to tell. For some reason, I did not gel with the short fiction very much in this anthology. So it was good. I'm glad it exists. I gave it three out of five stars. Okay, then I finished three five-star books in the latter half of the week because at this point I was just ready to read something amazing and... Well, that happened. Anyway, I was ready to read something amazing, so I finished reading This Is How You Lose the Time War by Amal El Motal and Max Gladstone, and this was a five-star read for me. This is a science fiction sort of book about two time travelers that are on opposite sides of a time war that begin writing letters to each other and leaving them at different points along the timelines, and the more they do this, the more they gradually begin to realize that they are falling in love with each other. And they're both women. 
and I fucking loved this book. This book broke my heart in the best possible way. If you've read Department of Speculation by Jenny Offal, it gave me similar feelings to that, although it is a completely different book. It deals, though, similarly with these same, like, really important life questions of a meaningful relationship without coming across as like cliched or sappy or trite or something like that. I guess if I had to describe this book, it would be a combination of Department of Speculation meets Portrait of a Lady on Fire, the movie. Um, it was absolutely amazing. There's really like, there's so much that I could say about this book. I could tell you about just every single synonym that the authors use for the characters red and blue. We only know their names red and blue, and yet they address each other in other words for those colors that come to mean the most amazing terms of endearment hidden upon layers and layers of secret codes and espionage and just pining across timelines for each other. This book was incredible. I got it from the library and I'm now going to have to buy it, which also should give you an indication of how much I loved it. I couldn't recommend it to you highly enough. Like I said, I gave it five out of five stars. I then read this absolutely adorable YA contemporary romance called Every, we Every Reason We Shouldn't, and it's by Sarah Fujimura. This is a book that is about two um, mixed-race Asian-American teenagers, both of whom have this connection to ice skating. There is the girl Olivia, who is the daughter of two gold medalist Olympic figure skaters, and she has been sort of a young figure skating prodigy whose star couldn't seem to stop rising until she had a really discouraging time at one of the like seniors competitions that basically ended her entire skating career and her run at the Olympics. And then there's Jonah, who is her love interest. He's a new boy in town and he wants to be a speed skater and he comes to Olivia's family's struggling ice rink because they are the ones that are willing to give him the most ice time for his money. And the two of them are gradually developing feelings for each other. They're brought together by the fact that they're both these really high achieving teenagers that have kind of grown up under unusual circumstances. They've both spent so much time in the skating world that they find it kind of hard to relate to their peers that are in just like regular high school enrollment and stuff like that. You know, they have this moment where all of their friends who are not skaters are talking about like movie marathons and going to like the prom type dance or something like that. And they're just looking at each other like, is this real life? Is this really something that is, is important to people? So it's kind of about the two of them having to balance their dreams and their goals with how much time they are willing to spend working for a few minutes of glory when it comes to the pursuit of their sport and what are they going to do with their relationship because more pressure is put on that as they begin to advance in their careers. This story was just super duper adorable. I wanted to mention that it is written by a white lady, but she is part of a um, mixed family. Her husband's Japanese American, and she wanted to write a book, she said specifically, because her biracial sons who are Japanese American didn't really get to see books where they themselves were represented as the hero or the love interest in American stories. She said they gravitated a lot towards Japanese language stories because of that representation, but she wanted to write something within the context of American literature for that. So I thought that that was neat. And I'm glad that she said something about that in the author's note too, because I have gone through kind of a rash recently of books that are not own voices representation that either do or do not really talk about that at all in the author's note, where it's like, okay, based off of context, I figured it out, but also I'm glad that like she engaged with that and she engaged with what it's like being a white person who wrote this book and like trying to be respectful to this culture that she has now become a part of through her marriage and families while also, you know, just being respectful and doing your homework and stuff like that. That book was great. I gave it five out of five stars, which is something that I feel like I never do for YA contemporaries. I don't normally read a whole ton of them, but I'm really glad that I read this one. And then the last book that I read this week was Well Read Black Girl, which is edited by Glory Edom. This is a book that is a collection of personal essays and reflections by black women writers and readers about the importance of seeing themselves in literature, the books that shaped them growing up, the books that helped them become the writers and the thinkers that they are today. Some of the people that you'll encounter in this book are uh, acclaimed writers in their own right, like you'll see Danielle Clayton, you'll see Jacqueline Woodson, you'll see 
see a bunch of different other authors that you'll probably recognize in this book. And I read this as part of my challenge to read 30 books by black authors this year. I think if you're looking for a good place to start when it comes to reading books by black authors, you should pick this up because even if you don't end up reading all of the essays, there are a lot of different lists of books by black authors. And at the end of the book is a list, a master list of every work that is talked about in the book by all of the essayists. So that was excellent. I gave that five out of five stars as well. Then I finished playing the Final Fantasy VII Remake. Wow, um, that was really, really intense there at the end. I will say um, one of the things that I think is a really valid criticism that's leveled against this game is the portrayal of the character Barrett. So like, I've never finished the original Final Fantasy VII, but I was curious what, as I was playing the remake what it was that like black gamers and black reviewers thought about Barrett's character because on the one hand, he is this really cool, powerful, badass character that is like leading people to save the planet from inevitable destruction. And on the other hand, it does seem like especially considering that it's 2020, his writing leans a lot more into these stereotypical representations of black men being hyper masculine and hyper aggressive and just, you know, sometimes the 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 representation like veers more into a caricature of him as like a meathead and just muscle without, you know, being a complex fully well-rounded characters. So I did some digging, wanted to read what black reviewers had said, and I'm going to link some articles down below if you're interested at all in reading what black reviewers had to say about Barrett and Final Fantasy VII Remake. There's also um, a bit in there that is about the difference in translation between the original Japanese and the original Final Fantasy VII game, and the way that the person that translated it into English, who was just one guy that did the translation in as basically a fan in like two weeks and there's some interesting um, discussion there about the way that like Barrett's tone of voice and the dialect in which his lines are written got changed by that one guy and that has really informed a lot of the way that the English speaking audience that plays this game um, interacts with that character and sees that character represented. So definitely go check that out. I think it's really important to read. And then we played one board game this week. It was an old favorite, Architects of the West Kingdom, but this time we played with the new expansion, Age of Artisans. I'm just holding up a sham here. It's full of emptiness. I'm just holding up the lid because the box is still on the table because we're set up to play another game. Age of Artisans is great as an example of what board game expansions should do because it actually adds to and enhances the experience of the game without unnecessarily bloating the game and making it take much more time than it otherwise should. So Age of Artisans mainly adds in a new action that you can take that is part of the game's countdown timer. Normally the countdown timer advances whenever a player builds a building or works on the cathedral since that's the main focus of the game and the game ends after a certain number of buildings and cathedral buildings have uh, have happened. The Age of Artisans expan expansion adds on a couple different types of cards that you can get where you will put another one of your workers on the building track but instead of building something you will get to improve a card that you already have. You can improve workers by adding on what's called tools. Basically, it gives you a little extra bonus every time you use that worker's special power. Or you can improve buildings that you have already built for a one-time bonus, usually of some sort of uh, resources, and you also get a certain number of victory points for having an improved building. It adds a couple other things too, like new buildings, new apprentice cards, um, a couple new player mats that are in there. But the addition of the improvements slash tool cards are the main thing that this expansion adds. I think that another thing the expansion does really well is in addition to adding that extra action on the new tracker that keeps track of the game countdown, it does give you some options to refresh the pool of apprentices that you have available to buy, which I think also helps to keep the game fresh because it can get a little bit stagnant when there's just the same pool of apprentices there the entire time and no one's buying any of them because they're not very good. So this does add a couple times at which you will place a worker and then it will direct you to refresh. Same thing with the black market. 
it adds a new action where you are able to um, go to the black market and hire an apprentice or get one of the tool cards to add on. So it definitely, uh, I think, buffs that spot in the black, mar black market a little bit because I don't think people take that action as much because it's a weaker action compared to the other ones. So I thought that was super excellent. And I say all of this even after <laughs> I lost the game by one point. It was so unfair i mean well balanced yes but as a gamer as a person going through the experience of trying my hardest to then lose by one point feels both really good but also really bad i really enjoyed it though i can't recommend this game highly enough i really think that it is just one of my favorite games of all time at this point I don't foresee a future in which I will ever play this without the expansion, so if you like this game and you're looking to enhance your experience of it, I would recommend the expansion. And I think at this point, that is going to do it for my Geekly Wrap Up for this week. So let me know down in the comments below something that you have been reading or enjoying this week. Um, I would especially love to hear if any of y'all are planning on doing the Asian Readathon. By the time you're watching this, I think my TBR for that will already have gone live. So let me know if you're gonna be doing that. Maybe we can buddy read something. If you like this video and you'd like to see more of what I do, go ahead and subscribe to my channel because that's the best way to get notifications every time I post a new video. As always, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!